Well, hi there, folks. This is Kim Willis again with another episode in our podcast series. And I've got a fantastic guest on today, tonight, wherever <laughs> wherever you're located, in the form of Rich Blanton. Now, Rich hails from Johnson City in Tennessee in the United States of America. And uh, I've known Rich since last year, and I've been impressed with his uh, integrity, uh, his diligence, he's fantastic uh, on platforms like LinkedIn, a very great, a great guy connecting people and, and all the rest of it. And anyway, one thing led to another and we've arrived at this point where we're doing an interview. Say hi, Rich. Hey, how's it going, Kim? Uh, good, mate. Good. So uh, it's night time for me, morning for you. Great. All good. You've got the day ahead of you. My day will be winding down soon, but let's get into this uh, interview. And uh, probably the best thing to start with is, is uh, I'll just run through sort of the brief uh, overview of your story, and then we'll we'll bring you into it. So let me just put on my my reading glasses here, and we'll start this now. As I said, John, um, Rich Rich started. Uh, Rich lives in Johnson City. In Tennessee, okay. Now I uh, will get. I'll come back to that. How he got to Johnson City? It's only a small city, about two hundred thousand uh, people. I've had a look at it. Not been there. I want to. I want to um, travel and tour through that part of the world, the southern states particularly. But uh, so he's in Johnson City. It's not that far from uh, from the east coast of of the US. And, uh, but he's had a very interesting career-wise, he's had a very interesting uh, pathway. So he's, he started out in the, in the defence industry, actually, and I'll just read the little bullet points here. And uh, the, he was a kind of an engineering tech kind of a guy, and he was in that industry for seven, seven years. And then from there, he, he became uh, a top sales executive for the biggest privately owned medical business, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, in, in the world. And right. he was there for 14 years. He became a top sales executive, so tremendous uh, results he was getting there. Rich will share the story as to why he you know, moved out of that, uh, that business or you know, left, that, left that company because um, after that, he, he, um, he started to... He decided he wanted to do his own thing. I think that's fair to say. And so he started dabbling. He loves cars, very much into muscle cars. And uh, so he started trading, buying and selling muscle cars, finding muscle cars on based on clients' requirements and making the commission there. So obviously entrepreneurial, uh, entrepreneurial blood is sort of coursing through his veins there. And then... Uh, from there, he, he started, he did that for seven years, and four years he was trading currency or shares, ETFs, crypto, anything where he could make money, and he did pretty well out of it, as I've been told. And uh, he seems to have a knack for uh, turning opportunity into revenue. And then in the last couple of years, he's been helping people, mainly people involved with uh, you know, companies, corporate America, let's say, um, middle management type people, maybe other sales executives, people like that, helping them find a franchise business opportunity. So that's what he does now in the main. So he's a franchise consultant. He has his own franchise consulting business. All right. So is that does that sort of, you know, get it fairly reasonably right there for you, Rich? Is there anything that I missed or... Didn't quite get right. Any correction? No, that's a good summary. That's a good summary. Right now, so you started out as a, a, a sort of a technical guy. Um, so did you, you? You? How did you? How did you get into that arena? You? You went to college or something like that? How'd that start? Yeah. So after high school, uh, I ended up going to a, a community college here locally, and I uh, got a couple of degrees: one in electronic engineering technology, and one in instrumentation engineering technology. And uh, very fortunate, about a month before I graduated, I actually uh, 
got hired on at a uh, large missile systems defense company called Raytheon, which is world known, you know, worldwide known. Uh, so that's kind of how I got started in that business. Right. Okay. So you're you're pretty good on the tech side, is that right? I'm fairly good on the tech side. Yeah. 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 And what what uh, what was the catalyst for you to move into the medical field? Hmm. That's a great question. So I'll try to keep that short. Uh, so the company Raytheon Defense Systems here locally where I live, they were located in Bristol, Tennessee. They were going to move their facilities totally out of our area. And they were going to Birmingham, Alabama, and also uh, California. So they shut down the plant. It was a two-year process of filtering out uh, and shutting down. And so I lost my job. Wow. So I was out of a job. I was married at the time. I had a five month old son. So I didn't care what I did. I just needed to make money, right? Yeah. Uh, house payment, you know, had a car payment uh, like most people. So uh, I searched and searched jobs, you know, just, just wasn't finding what I wanted to do or needed to do without moving out of the area, moving away from our parents, et cetera. And so uh, an opportunity came up uh, in sales with uh, back in the old days uh, in facsimiles, fax machines, copiers, and printers. And that's where my first sales job sprang from. Right. And uh, the early days as a sales consultant, executive, how did it feel? Was it a major uh, adjustment for you? Yeah, so what was the major adjustment, I think, is just understanding, uh, you know, you're going to be as successful as you want to be. It wasn't that way in the corporate world. I mean, you was to a certain level and you could make a certain amount of money, uh, but it was a lot slower. Uh, so when I got into the sales world, uh, I was really able to capitalize just on my, you know, connecting with people and solving problems. And, and really, that's what I came to learn is figure out what their problem is and understand their problem and solve it, figure out a solution. And I know that sounds simplistic in the, you know, the printing and copier world, but you know, when you have uh, people that's responsible for all that for high end executives, it puts a lot of pressure on them. So within two years, I was their top sales executive and making double what I made at Raytheon after seven years. Wow. And, uh, transitioning from that technical background to where you're talking to people and kind of hustling you didn't have any challenges there it was kind of just a natural thing for you to do uh no i think you always have challenges i had i had challenges and had to learn the behavior of people yeah uh, and so i had to understand where they were coming from and be able to relate to people at all different levels and uh, once i was able to do that I became successful quicker and quicker, but it, it took me, like I said, there was a lot of up and downs in those two years, um, but it was, it was ultimately all up at the end. Right. And so after the two year period, what was the, uh, the progress from that point? So after two years, um, I would have probably stayed in that position. Uh, however, the owner of that company, uh, and most of the sales folks like myself that was with that company didn't always see it eye to eye. He was kind of a micromanager and I'm not one to be micromanaged. Uh, and, you know, I was the top salesperson that they had out of five people after two years. So I've proven myself. I didn't feel yeah. like I needed to prove it anymore. And I was very fortunate. I was kind of looking around for other opportunities. Uh, now that I was going to stay out of the technical world and maybe stay in the sales world. And uh, actually a recruiter contacted me and uh, that's how I came on board with uh, a company called Medline Industries. They're the world's top privately held company and still today are after five generations of being family owned. Okay. Now just, just, just before you continue on with that little uh, part of your story, Going back to the previous one, where there were five sales uh, consultants and you quickly became number one, what was the difference between you and them? What were you doing that maybe they weren't doing? 
Uh, so I will have to admit, uh, having the technical background that I had in the electronic field, believe it or not, helped because that was a transition during that time uh, to where copiers were first being networked with computers. And so I already had a jump start on how to help people. So when I went in to look at how their operations worked and what their responsibilities were uh, and the issues that they were having, the problems, you know, their pain points, I was quickly able to bring a solution to the table that rectified that for them. And honestly, after that, it became word of mouth. It was so easy to go into businesses after businesses and utilize those references and referrals from those other companies uh, that I'd helped, you know, bring solutions to the table. Right. So because of your past uh, experiences, the uh, on the technical side of things, you're probably or perhaps able to instill confidence more easily compared to um, maybe the other uh, reps working in, the, in that company. That'd be fair to say? Yeah, it would be. The other four reps uh, did not have the technical background that I had, so I had a little yeah. bit of a, a start there. Um, and then intertwine that with just people skill. Yeah, that's what I was going to say, because uh, you, you, you had a natural people skill, didn't you? A natural uh, way of um, relaxing people and instilling belief. That's the feeling. Well, I, I can't yeah. say back then, but now the rich... Blanton that I see now definitely has those qualities and I'm, I'm surmising or supposing that uh, it was uh, something that you've had for most of your life. Yeah, I, as, as my mom would always say, uh, I never met a stranger and now my wife <laughs> says that. She's like, can you, can you not go anywhere without talking to someone? <laughs> so. yeah. Oh, that's awesome. So anyway, so then you went to a new company, right? And how did that work out? Yes. So it was great. I mean, I learned a lot of great skills, uh, went through a lot of challenges, made the most money I've ever made in my life. Very, very large six figure income. Uh, but, you know, after 14 years, actually after about 12 years uh, in my age, I was like, OK, I'm really tired of trading, you know, my time for money. And that's really what you do in a corporate world, even though I was making great money. I was working 70 hours a week. Yeah. I was doing a lot of traveling. You know, it just got old. And so I was looking to make a change. And so an opportunity came up uh, within changing what I was doing with sales and hospitals to surgery centers. But once that transition took place, uh, which was supposed to be a little bit better, a little bit less money, a little bit less travel, a little bit less stress. And I'm OK with that because I, I've done real well to that point. Um, but unfortunately, uh, like most people, when they hit a crossroads, uh, I went from the best senior VP in the country I was working for to absolutely the worst, uh, kind of a narcissist type person, micromanager, you know, he, he was, he operated by fear and I don't operate that way. So no. that was, that was my crossroads. So there was a clash. Big clash. Yeah. <laughs> How did Big you handle clash. it? What happened? Uh, so I spent about a year and a half in that position. And uh, honestly, after a year and a half, uh, I, I was just fed up. I was just, yeah. I'd had all I could take. Uh, and I, I just lost all will to be involved in working that position anymore. And so uh, I had a sit down conversation with this particular person about a two hour conversation. And I felt like it did some good uh, because it was kind of quiet for a couple of days. And then the same old, same old started back up. And, yeah. and at that point, uh, you know, I talked to my wife and I said, listen, I'm going to call his senior VP uh, because I'm done. And I'm just going to tell him in a very professional manner what I think. I probably will be fired because the senior VP hired him. Uh, you know, I said, are you okay with that? She said, yeah. She said, you're stressed all the time. Let's just do what you need to do. So that's, that's what happened. And two days later, I was letting it. Right. Yeah. So you were half expecting it. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So you made the transition then from working for a boss, working in a large company to working for yourself at home. 
Yeah, that's that was a huge transition. Something I've always wanted to do my entire life, just never had the guts to do it. And sometimes yeah. timing was an issue as well. Uh, so this gave me the time I needed to think about uh, where I needed to go in my life, kind of reset, if you will. Yeah. And uh, so that's kind of where I took off from the, the muscle car side. Yeah. Well, you have a great love for muscle cars, don't you? Oh, yeah. Of yeah. all descriptions, American yeah. and European. <laughs> love them all. <laughs> Yeah, uh, we've had a few talks about that before, but um, and you proved that you could make money in that new endeavor with that new uh, activity. Yeah, I had a great, uh, great time doing that. I still do it a little bit uh, more of a. It's so much more of a hobby now because I'm making yeah. money in other income streams. Yeah, uh, I still have a few in my collection that's that, you know, I can sell at some point, but I, I, I did. I made a lot of good money, enjoyed doing it while I was doing it, but have made some transitions. Yeah. So the next uh, chapter in your book was the work in the, on the trading side of things, financial instruments, financial products, trading shares and so on, crypto. Yes. What, what, uh, what, you know, how, did you, how did you get into that industry? Well, I just, you know, I've always had an interest in stocks, but never really took the time to sit down and try to understand and learn. And there's so much to learn, uh, so much I don't know, uh, but there's so much a person can do to sit there and figure out what you can do to make money in stocks and understand the trends and the history and companies. And so I did a lot of research, a lot of reading, a lot of studying, and then I started investing in stocks. And uh, mm. my first stock I invested in was Netflix. <laughs> Pretty good pick. Uh, $80 a share. What are they selling for now? Uh, over 500 There you go. Yeah. Yep. And uh, you had some other wins as well, didn't you? Oh, I had some great wins in some uh, real estate uh, investments. Uh, crypto investments, uh, just a lot of, you know, a lot of wins. I had a lot of losses, though, don't get me wrong, especially up front. Uh, yeah. I'll never forget the first year I was investing. Uh, you know, you, you cannot let greed rule. I lost $80,000 in one day. Wow. So, uh, you know, hard lessons to learn, uh, but, you know, I overcame that, and it took me about a year and a half. But, uh, uh, you know, I've not lost anything over 10,000 since then. Yeah, it's great. Uh, so, yeah, a lot of traders um, sometimes have to battle with their own demons, don't they? Yes, absolutely. Know, know thyself is the command. Know yeah. thyself. <laughs> yeah, greed. Remove greed from your vocabulary. Yeah. But also fear, controlling fear. Oh, yeah, absolutely. It is. Um, because it can go both ways. It um, definitely can. And uh, then you started looking at franchising, not just as a, an opportunity to help other people into their own franchise business, but also for yourself. Look, you, yeah. you went through the process intending to buy a franchise. Yeah, actually I did. In fact, uh, my first venture was looking at local traditional businesses to buy. Right. And I looked at several uh, businesses that were 25 years and older. And the reason I was looking at those particular businesses is they already have proven history. Uh, they had good financials. And I was looking for those particular owners that were going to retire, ready to give it up, didn't have family to go to, et cetera. Um, so none of those really panned out for me. So then I started looking at franchising. And a good friend of mine, his wife is good friends with another lady that uh, owns a franchise here in the area for 26 years. And her husband and uh, her were going to get a divorce. And so she was going to sell her franchise. It really never went on the market, but it was through my friend that I found out about it. So I reached out to her and, and started talking to her about the financials and looking at it, et cetera. And what I learned real quick that I didn't know is you have to go through a process with the franchisor, which is the corporation. 
you know, you have to be awarded a franchise. You just don't go buy a franchise. Just because I had $200,000 didn't mean I could just buy the franchise. I had to yeah. be qualified to uh, that business model. And, and so what I had to do is go through the franchise developer of that company and all the way up to the CEO of that company. And I was uh, eventually awarded the franchise if I could get the pricing worked out with this particular lady. So that's kind of how that operated. Yeah. And how did that end up? It did not end up going through because she would not accept my offer. I didn't burn the bridge uh, simply because, you know, you never know when that opportunity can come back up. But she had a lot and what a lot of people do. They have a lot of emotional goodwill in the value of their price. And you, you can't buy a business based on emotional goodwill. Yeah. Uh, you have to buy a business based on their financials and what it's producing and what it, the potential of that business can produce. And I offered her uh, a good 20% over that price. Uh, she just didn't accept it. Yeah, yeah. They are very much tied up in it. They start it from scratch, don't they? They start it from nothing and build it from the ground up. <laughs> and uh, they've got a lot. They might, they've got money invested, but they've also got a lot of emotional uh, investment in it as well. Uh, sometimes they, they're too close to it. Um, so from there, you decided that maybe now that you understand the franchise process, maybe it would be a good thing to help other people do it. How did, how did you transition to the consulting side? Yeah, so I learned so much through that process and realized there is just so much information out there, you know, the World Wide Web that we go to and do our Google searches. It, it's just a bunch of noise. And when I say noise, it's just you don't even know where to look uh, yeah. because you start clicking on businesses that you like, et cetera. And then you get inundated with, you know, 50,000 emails, text messages, phone calls from all these different people that you didn't know you were going to get a phone call or text message from. Yeah. And it's frustrating. It becomes frustrating. And then you become uh, so frustrated that you just don't want to research it anymore because you don't know the right areas or the right people to talk to that you can trust. That's where it came about. And I ran upon a company um, that I like very well uh, that helps establish other franchise corporations in America. And so what they do is they pre-qualify them. They have to have a good financial history. They have to work well with, you know, consultants, et cetera. And, uh, you know, I paid them a pretty large sum of money uh, to be involved with their network uh, so I could have access to all of these franchises throughout the U.S. And then so I could actually do true consulting with people who are looking to, you know, transition from that world of corporate owned to, you know, being a business owner themselves. Yeah, uh, absolutely. So, um, and the company that you associated with, they're one of the biggest in uh, in the U.S., aren't they? I've got, and they've got 300 approximately 300 franchise opportunities in their portfolio, haven't they? Yes, they do. They've got 300. It's always growing and interchanging because they want to keep the best franchise companies that will work with people in their portfolio. Yeah. And what, what sort of people tend to get attracted to franchising, buying a, a franchise for themselves, in your experience? Yeah, so from my experiences, folks, uh, similar to me that, you know, there's some kind of crossroads in their life or they're looking ahead at trying to build another stream of income. You know, it's it's one thing that I've learned through uh, leaving the corporate world. Do not depend on one stream of income. I always have multiple streams. So those folks that are generally uh, looking that I'm talking to have just come to a crossroads of, okay, I've been in the corporate world for 20 years, 25 years. And yeah, I've done well, but I'm, I want to do something on my own. That's fulfilling. I want to build something for me and not another company. I want to have something that I can have a sellable asset, you know, at the, at the end of my career, or I can just continue, you know, with that stream of income and put the right people in place to, to manage and run that company. Yeah, uh, very attractive for uh, many people. Yeah, every year, um, lots of people 
decide to start a business and they do it themselves. They don't go down the franchising pathway. Um, why do you think some people take that pathway versus going down the franchise pathway? Because as I see it, uh, franchising, is, I mean, there's always risk, but you've got a proven system that seemed to be a kind of a, a safer option, but some people, a lot of people still take the other option. Any comments or thoughts on that? Yeah, I could give you a personal uh, comment from personal experience. So I looked at the same thing. I thought, well, why shouldn't I do this? It costs less money. I can start my own business and it's going to cost me less money. Well, not necessarily. Up front, you think it does, but it truly doesn't because if you're inexperienced in any business opportunity, it's going to cost you time, mistakes, and that costs you money. It's going to cost you, take you longer to build your business, longer to get your return on the investment, longer to cash flow. So ultimately, it's going to take longer and cost more money to get that business up and running in five years than if you just pay franchise fees as fees up front and get your business started with a proven model that's already there. All you have to do is plug and play. That's right. And so with uh, people who take the, the first uh, pathway, um, seems to me that the risks are higher. The risks of failure are higher. Um, many of them probably don't know what they're doing uh, for a prolonged period of time. And some of them just run out of money at the end of it because they've, they've so much trial and error, they don't have a proven system. <laughs> and uh, unless they've got very deep pockets, some of them have to close the doors because they just can't hang on any longer. Is that a fair comment? Yeah, yeah that's a fair statement. It's unfortunate, but it's fair. Um, and, and usually that happens just because of lack of experience and don't have the deep pockets you know, to fund that business yeah. long enough for it to succeed. And marketing is a huge part of that. And a lot of people just don't understand and know how to market their business properly. Yeah, that's right. Now, uh, when people think of franchising, or not all people, but a significant percentage of people, I, I, I think, when they, uh, when they think of franchising, they often think of, oh, you know, McDonald's, the big restaurant type of franchise, $2 million uh, investment and all the rest of it. But uh, franchising has, has changed somewhat, hasn't it? over the last, you know, 20 or 30 years. And there are now other types of franchise opportunities that don't require that huge uh, outlay of buying, you know, buying uh, real estate and all the rest of it. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I was one of those people as well, Kim. You know, I was thinking of the Dunkin' Donuts of the world, you know, the McDonald's of the world, you know, yeah. the, the franchise names that we're familiar with, you know, the fitness centers and so forth. And most of those business costs between one to two million to get started and doesn't include real estate. And you really have to have multiple outlets to have a successful chance at that revenue. And that's the way those business models are designed. And so the majority of business franchises out there are not like that. So that's what I learned. There's, there's so many business opportunities in the franchising world uh, that can easily be, be gotten started for 250 or less. Yeah. Uh, and the thing is, they're home based. A lot of these are home yeah. based, and that bothers people a lot of times. Home based? What do you mean home based? I don't want people at my home. No, it just means you can operate your business from your home. It doesn't mean you're going to have people in your home. No. Uh, huge savings and costs on real estate there. Yeah. And, and, and what sort of uh, industries, so you've got hundreds of uh, different franchise opportunities, but uh, what sort of industries typically um, are on offer or can you get involved with? Oh, there's so many. We have about 30 different categories of businesses in, in the industry. Yeah. industry. In the home service industry, there's just so many that surround residential homes, for example because people yeah. need work on their homes or they need something done to their homes or real estate management, you know, all these businesses you can operate from your house. Yeah. Yeah. Even financial uh, offerings, uh, financial type businesses for those that come from that type of background. Absolutely. Yeah. I've had a, had a, had a look at uh, some of the, uh, some of the opportunities on offer. It's uh, quite amazing. The breadth. 
as um, it, yeah, it is wide. Yeah, yeah, it is wide. The breadth is wide, and it gives people the opportunity uh, to see really what best you know piques their interest, and that's kind of where I come in after that point. Yeah, and um, what about financing? How much do people need to have some of their own cash, don't they? But they can finance part of it. Is that how it works? Yeah, so uh, you know, you, you run into all different situations. The last two deals I've done is paid cash, and it's been you know a little over one hundred and fifty thousand. Yeah. Um, you do you do have to have some upfront. They expect to have the franchising fees paid upfront in cash. Yeah. Um, yeah. And most of those franchising fees, for the most part, are around averaging about 50 k. Right. Uh, the remainder of your business that you can finance. And, and quite frankly, this is just personal opinion, of course. Uh, right. I would recommend it, financing as much as you can and let your business pay for itself. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so how do you help people? What, what's the advantage of people um, working with you as opposed to going, you know, going direct to one of the franchise companies? What do you offer? What's the, the X factor? Yeah, so it's it would be like, here's a good analogy. It would be like uh, you're looking for a house to buy for yourself, correct? And yeah. you're driving through a neighborhood and you see this house for sale. And uh, it's for sale by, you know, a real estate company. But you go to their front door, knock on their door, and, and you're wanting to look at their house. I don't think they're going to let you in. <laughs> you yeah. know, uh, so it, it's a good way for a person like myself to represent my client with many different companies to where if a client of mine went straight to a franchisor, that franchisor is going to look at them to see if they qualify, number one. Number two, if they're a good fit. But if they're not a good fit, guess what? that ends the relationship, then that client is going to have to go to another franchise or in another franchise. So it just, it gets old and, and hard fast because of the time they're spending. I eliminate all that because once I understand, you know, the goals and values of my client, and then I'm reaching out to the franchisors, filtering different things to see if we even need to have a conversation with them. And if we do not find a good connection within a particular franchisor, guess what? I still know my client well enough to go to the next franchisor. So I'm a good filtering process for them. Very much so. So you can save them time, but also reduce their stress and anxiety levels, can't you, during this process? Absolutely. Absolutely. It's, not, it's not easy. And, yeah, I just see great benefit yep. having these people deal with somebody like yourself and just – make it so much, much, so much better, less stress. Well, it's, it, you're exactly right. The stress is huge, and especially when you really don't know the right questions to ask. You yeah. really don't know who to go for, for this or that. Like, you know, I've got so many people in my network, you know, franchise attorneys, uh, financial folks to help people, you know, find money to help them on their loans, et cetera. I don't get any kickbacks from that. It's just, it's, I supply services for my clients to help them through the process. And it's kind of a one-stop shop, if you will. It might be a dirty word, but it's a one-stop shop. You know, ask me your questions. Let me figure them out for you. Yeah, Instead yeah, yeah. of going to 10 different franchise companies asking the same questions. Yeah, makes sense. And, and they don't pay any more money dealing with you, that, do they? Doesn't cost Zero. Them Zero. That's right. That's yeah. Well, that's fantastic. Now, are there any other uh, points that need that you think should be made before we close the interview? Anything else that that I may have missed? You know what? You, no, you've done a great job. I will say something on the money because some people uh, don't understand that right up front. So, how do you make money then? There's got to be there's some gimmick to it, or you know, yeah. how can you not charge me or so, yeah, I could charge, and actually I've talked to several businessmen who who make way more than I do in the millions that said, Rich, you need to charge 20000 Just charge them 20000 up front. It eliminates a lot of clientele up front. You'll only talk to serious people if you charge that up front. And then if they 
sign an agreement with the franchise company, give them the 20,000 back. It creates accountability. Now I could do that and you'd eliminate probably 90% of my clientele. And I don't want to eliminate 90% because those 90% are people like me. I was in that 90% looking for a business opportunity. And if I'd have got eliminated because of not, you know, of course I had 20,000, you know, I did have the money, but I wouldn't give them to them. I don't want to eliminate people for that. So the franchise corporations pay me a straight fee for vetting and qualifying and bringing them the right clients. Yeah. And, and I do 70% of the work for the franchise company. So, you know, I'm really more of a laser focused guy instead of a shotgun guy. And that's really what you're doing from a franchise corporation standpoint, trying to find the folks that's the right fit. You know, they're using the shotgun approach. Well, I use a laser focused approach. Yeah. And uh, so that's, that's kind of how we operate. Yeah. Well, it's good from the franchisor's point of view because it, like you say, it saves them a lot of time and hassle and money. Um, it's better for them just to pay you for doing that, that valuable and vital work. And then they only get to talk to the, the best candidates. Absolutely. Fantastic. And uh, what's the best way that people can contact you, Rich? Yeah, so the best place that folks can find me is on LinkedIn uh, or uh, honestly, you can just catch me on my email at rich, R-I-C-H, at franchiseconsultingusa.com. Yeah, great. Well, I'll make sure all of these details are in the uh, in the show notes so that um, people will have access to that if I didn't write it down now. So, um, yeah, well, look, that's, uh, that's fantastic. Uh, I learned some more. I've been studying this industry for a little while now, and um, I've picked up a few more uh, little nuggets of information, and I'm sure people who are either watching or listening to the audio if it's in podcast form uh, will get a lot of value from that. So if you want to reach out to Rich and have a chat, he's a great guy to talk to, very helpful and uh, knowledgeable. So I think we might uh, say... Goodbye, and uh, thanks a lot, Rich. That was fantastic. Loved it. Loved every minute of it. Thank you so much, Kim. I appreciate it. Pleasure. Okay, bye for now.